um, um, now uh, as, as soon as they finalize their the financial year ends for, for, for end of June. So with that, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members, um, there's also another piece of administration that we must deal with in, 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 insofar as it relates to the presentation. Um, you would recall when we had the closed uh, briefing session, Honorable Chair, uh, we gave you a briefing document with the members um, for the purpose of the open session, which is uh, the televised session. We will now deal with the, the, the slide summary presentation that talks directly to the public information, which is the audit report. So uh, you'll see um, the, the presentation that we'll, we'll deal with, although it's a continuation from the previous session, uh, we'll be dealing with a different document that just summarizes the same information that was contained in more detail in the briefing note. But if there's any detail that's required, honorable members are more than welcome to refer to that document that was distributed in March uh, that contains all the written narrative doc, uh, detail uh, for any questions or, or follow up. But ours will deal with the, with the presentation which we'll get into in the next uh, short while. Then this same presentation, honorable chair, honorable members, is also the same presentation that we shared more or less with the portfolio committee a couple of weeks ago. So uh, the normal process would dictate that we first engage the portfolio committee. And then obviously once we've engaged the portfolio committee on any outcomes, those um, 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 outcomes or, or, or information, that information is then shared with, with SCOPA. But this time around we, we first engaged and then uh, obviously we went to portfolio committee. But we also uh, afforded them the same courtesy by sharing the same information uh, that we shared with SCOPA with the chairperson of the of the committee in terms of the detailed briefing notes. So they are also well versed in, in, and well briefed on the detail um, of, of what's happening in the portfolio uh, that we did during that uh, engagement. Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, the presentation will also be shared between myself and Mr. Kaleli. Um, I've unfortunately had a, a procedure on my throat so I'm quite limited in terms of the amount of talking I could I can do as part of my rehabilitation. So Mr. Kaleli will be doing the, the bunch of the, the presentation. I will do the intro all the way up until a point where we get to the actual detail. I'll just do the, 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 the intros uh, for now, Honorable Chairperson. Um, Stephen, I will do the sharing. And when I hand over to you, you will then do the sharing of the slides. Uh, thing. So, Honourable Chair, Honourable Members, can I get a confirmation that uh, members can see the screen that I am sharing, please? Right, colleagues, you will indicate if uh, there's any glitch. Um, are we all good to go? Yes. Mazamba nengi ya chabulu kutu sakube kwa nukufa kutai. Gule. Gizok choina next week. All right, Andres, are we in your hands? Thank you, Chair. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, so, Honorable Chairperson, I then take it that members can see the screen that's reflecting now. We should all be seeing a flag of the uh, Republic, uh, including the reputation promise of the AG. Yes. Thank you for that confirmation. Honorable Chair, I will now go to slide number five. Um, quickly at a high level, just as a way of a reminder, honorable members, um, this is the role uh, of, the, of, of the Auditor General. On an yes. annual basis, we examine three areas. Just, just just make it a full screen the presentation so that we manage because devices are not the same so that it's is, all right uh, is it a bit right. better actually? yeah call it a problem they'll indicate okay yeah there we go right perfect sharp thank you Che. So, Chair, um, as, I, as I quickly alluded to earlier on, just a quick reminder um, in terms of the work that the Office of the AG does, on an annual basis in line with our constitutional mandate, the Office of the AG examines three audit areas. The first one, Honorable Chair, audit being an audit, we look at the state of the financial management of the institutions that we audit, 
So we consult the financial statements that they would have submitted to us. And then we assess and examine those to make sure that those are fairly presented and that they don't contain any significant material misstatements. So what it basically means, Chair, is then there's the part where we look at the accounting. So one plus two equaling three. And that's the, the part where we must uh, balance the book and account and, and, and look at supporting evidence in terms of, of, of invoices. The second aspect that we look at as the Office of the AG, obviously these institutions would have come to Parliament. They would have requested certain funds to go and implement and meet certain objectives in line with their different respective mandates. And therefore they are required to then report uh, in terms of how well they have fared in achieving those objectives uh, for which they had planned to go and achieve in line with the money that they would have requested. So the Office of the AG then looks at the status of the performance reporting of these institutions. Uh, we, are, we only assess how well uh, uh, reliable, credible, and accurate they would have reported their performance in their performance reporting documents, honorable chair, honorable members. So that is where we give you feedback in terms of the uh, audit of predetermined objectives. Then, Honourable Chair, Honourable Members, as and when they were busy executing their daily um, activities and responsibilities, um, obviously they were also required to then comply with certain key legislation. Um, I mentioned the words key legislation intentionally because um, obviously there's a number of legislation that all these institutions must comply with, but our assessment is limited to those key ones, especially linked to the financial statement um, areas like the uh, PFMA, the Public Finance Management Act, as well as key supply chain management uh, laws and regulations. So uh, to this effect, also when you examine or inspect any um, Auditor General report for a particular institution, you will see the report is broken down in these three sp uh, specific distinct areas. So you'll get the financial uh, opinion in terms of the outcomes, and then you'll also get the um, feedback in terms of how well they have reported um, in terms of their performance information, and lastly, um, the status of how well they've observed the laws and regulations as and when they were executing their responsibilities. Now that we are, I have a, a, a reminder again, in terms of what it is that we look at, the areas that we look at, when we give feedback, honorable chair, honorable members, we give feedback in line with the following outcomes displayed on the screen. Uh, they go obviously from left to right in terms of being good to absolutely where we do not want to find ourselves in as a particular institution at any particular given point in time. The left hand side, Honorable Chair, is what we commonly refer to as a clean audit. Now, Honorable Chair, for any institution to say that they've attained a clean audit would mean that number one, if you refer to the previous screen, that they would have had to have presented uh, their financial affairs in a fair manner that, that represents the financial reporting framework and that is supported by the evidence. So in other words, one plus two equals three, they were able to achieve that without having any material misstatements in their financial statements. They were also able to accurately report on their status of performance information and how well they have fared in terms of their performance. And lastly, as in when they were executing their responsibilities, they did not have any significant or material instances of non-compliance with key legislation. So all three of those requirements have to be present in order for an institution to attain a clean audit outcome. In the event that an institution does not attain a clean audit outcome, but at least they were able to account for the financial affairs fairly, in other words, one plus two equal uh, or balance to three and the financial statements were fine. However, they had significant challenges in terms of performance reporting as well as uh, status of compliance. They would then fall within the yellow block where um, at least like I, I mentioned, financial affairs are accounted for, however still challenges with regard to either performance information or the, the compliance, key compliance with, with legislation. And then um, from, the, from the purple block all the way to the right, honorable chair, honorable members, it goes from bad to as um, qualified audit outcome, which then means that in a particular institution was not able to fully account for its financial affairs in a manner that's required by the, by the reporting framework. So they were not able to account fully for their financial affairs. And they also had instances of, of significant non-compliance as well as significant findings on AOPO. And then the, the, the worst opinion on the father's right-hand side is a disclaimer of audit outcome where a particular institution would have presented uh, financial statements However, the, the auditor uh, could not express a view due to limitations experienced 
in that particular environment. That's the worst outcome you can get because you've reported something, but you have absolutely no evidence to substantiate and, 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 and back up what you have reported. And therefore, the auditors are not even able to express a view. Whereas with the other ones, even though unfavorable, but at least you're able to say you got it wrong in this area or you got it wrong in this area that requires improvement. Then, Honorable Chair, with your permission and indulgence, I'm now going to deal with slide eight. So on slide eight, high level chair, uh, the office of the AG comes on an annual basis. We conduct our audits. We then do our reporting to um, oversight structures such as yourself, to those charged with governance, including management, the accounting officers, and all the boards. However, there's been a, a significant trend of, of, of minimal improvement over the past 10 or so financial years. The office of the AG also then as part of our work, we do some form of root cause analysis where we try and assist our institutions by looking at what the reasons are, why things are going wrong so that we can advise them properly in terms of implementing uh, recommendations. And then we identify themes as part of that process. And then we identify that the one theme that is really missing, that is, not, um, uh, that is actually resulting in government not uh, progressing and improving in terms of the audit outcome was noted to be a lack of accountability. To that effect, the office of the AG then went and developed the accountability theme, which we shared with all our institutions, as well as those uh, uh, charged with oversight, uh, such as yourself and the portfolio committees. Honorable Chair, honorable members, you would know then that this little accountability model or the wheel starts off with an individual in the middle that has his hand up or his or her, her hand up in the center saying, for us to be accountable, there needs to be certain things in place uh, to ensure accountability. The first one uh, of the pie chart is uh, step number two, where we need to plan appropriately and accordingly. We need to clearly define our targets and say what it is that we want to achieve. And everybody must understand what it is that is supposed to be achieved. Once that's done, then we move over to ensuring that we've implemented sufficient systems of internal control and supervision. That is the do part now where we now understand what we, we need to do. Let's go and do it now. You'll see it's also depicted by a set of cogs and wheels that are supposed to uh, illustrate a motion of, of, of doing and, and workings and mechanic, mechanics. Then honorable chair, honorable members, as and when people do, you don't wait right until the end. You must do regular checks, uh, make sure you monitor, this is required by all assurance providers. So we need everybody in the whole value chain that plays a role uh, in any particular institution is required to do regular checks to make sure that we are staying on course or on par to achieve our intended objectives. And those checks, Honorable Chair, will then reveal certain information. That information can be utilized to then either cost correct or us to say, well, something has gone wrong. Let us hold people accountable. That's the acting part now on the uh, fifth uh, 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 depiction there of the of the pie chart. To that effect, the Office of the AG has also developed the accountability um, handbook or the handbook on accountability. It's a document that the AG himself, Mr. Makwetu, shared at some point in time to Parliament as well. It contains all relevant pieces of legislation insofar as it relates to the status of finances um, that's covered uh, or required in the PFMA, the MFMA, and all these other pieces of relevant legislation from accounting offices and accounting authorities where um, we demonstrate that actually they are empowered to make sure that they can enforce consequences in terms of the legislation. So Honorable Chair, the last two uh, pieces of the pie chart are normally a bit contentious in terms of discussion. From our point of view as the Office of the AG, we've noted um, that if all these other preceding elements are implemented and, and dealt with correctly, normally it results in improved audit outcomes, Honorable Chair. And where there's improved audit outcomes, the big contentious discussion is, does it always then reflect the status of service delivery? Now, Honorable Chair, I've noted that some people would say it's very easy to get a clean audit outcome. You just don't have to do anything and then report that you've not done anything. Remember, ours is to report, and if you have reported fairly what your status is, then you cannot get adverse audit outcomes from the AG. However, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, we have noted that there's often a direct correlation between the audit outcomes and status of service delivery. Normally where there are challenges in terms of service delivery are also those same environments where there have been a history of unfavorable audit outcomes, a history of repeated disclaimers. And the, the whole logic behind it, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, is that if people then or officials implement proper financial 
and sound financial management disciplines, those disciplines often also spill over into other areas of work. They don't just deal with finances, but also the aspects of service delivery. And to that effect, you always also try and link the uh, improved audit outcomes uh, and, and hopefully also resulting in, in improvement for uh, the citizens through those institutions and uh, living up to the intended respective mandates as well as the objectives. Honorable Chair, I'm going to deal with this slide. Once I've dealt with the slide, I'm going to hand over to Stephen. He will do the projection from his side, Honorable Chair. And the, this is just a portfolio snapshot. You'll see very importantly at the top, Honorable Chair, it says excluding the water boards. So the, P the, the PFMA outcomes that are shared on the particular screen, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, are for the PFMA institutions with a 31 March year end. Like we mentioned earlier, the water boards have a June year end. So for the entities within this particular portfolio with the 31 March year end, we have the Water Research Commission, which is the WRC, the Department of Water and Sanitation, the DWS. We have the Water Trading Entity, as well as the trans caledon Tunnel Authority. So those are the four entities. And you'll see, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, as and when we go through the rest of the presentation, we'll be dealing just with um, the outcomes of these entities. Later on in the slides, there's a particular section that deals specifically with just the water boards. We'll have a similar slide for just the water boards. Insofar as this um, particular segment of the portfolio is concerned, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, uh, you would note there that there's been a, a slight regression in audit outcomes over the past five financial years. The one sore point is the fact that the trading entity has been repeatedly qualified over the past four years. Um, we also commend the department for having improved its financial outcomes uh, for the 2018 financial year. I think it's only the second time in the past 15 years that the, that the department has uh, obtained a financially unqualified audit outcome. But nonetheless, um, at least they, it shows that there was some, some improvement in this regard. The challenge now would lie with the department and the management to ensure that they uh, sustain these outcomes while affecting uh, the service delivery aspects that they are also required to then go and do. The one change in, 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 in the portfolio that is quite notable is the fact that the TCTA has regressed in terms of its financial um, um, uh, financial statement outcomes. Uh, the TCTA unfortunately attained a financially qualified or an outcome for the past financial year, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members. Uh, that was mainly as a result of, of qualifications on the tariff receivables. Uh, as well as a provision for compensation and the commitments. Honorable Chair, um, these areas, uh, two of these areas deal directly with some of the um, structural arrangements that, that the institution has with um, the project that's been implemented in Lesotho, the Lesotho Islands uh, water project. And the tariff receivables, there's a large portion of it which deals with the AMD or the asset uh, mining drainage uh, project. Um, where um, certain uh, accounting shortcomings were identified in terms of what the department had, uh, the entity had disclosed as, as its receivable. The provision for compensation uh, basically just dealt with uh, certain information that the, the, part of the entity is supposed to disclose insofar as it relates to cost that they potentially might incur in future for the displaced uh, people that relate to the implementation of the Lesotho Islands Water Project. And the commitment just generally deals with a lack of processes that we identified or shortcomings that we identified in the entity's ability to fully uh, maintain a commitment register in line with the requirements of, of the financial reporting framework. The WTE unfortunately uh, became a victim of circumstance. Um, if I look at uh, or one analyzes their outcomes, they were highly dependent on what's happening on the TCTA side. So the one qualification that relates to the tariff receivables also then impacted the WTE. Chair would recall when we did the initial briefing in March, we explained the relationship between the department, the WTE, as well as the TCTA, whereby, as uh, also noted by the, the CEO in, in his previous deliberations, the TCTA goes out to market, they get funds to go to come and implement projects on behalf of government. And once those projects are finalized, the projects get handed over to the department in the WTE so that they can then use those uh, uh, infrastructure projects to generate income, which income is then used to settle those outstanding liabilities that TCTA would have incurred with the market, if I can put it simplistically. 
So if there are challenges with regard to any financial modeling on the TCTA side, it then spills over onto the WTE side, honorable chair, honorable members. So on the next two slides, which is slide number 10, which should appear in the next couple of seconds on your screens, is the key message with regard to the uh, um, department and its entities. Uh, we've already spoken about the DWS, which we, we commend them and, and, and hopefully they will then go and implement those measures to make sure that they sustain these outcomes despite the challenges that they are facing. Uh, and then we spoke about the misstatements on the limitations. Um, unfortunately, the whole audits of the portfolio were finalized late, the annual report of the department, as a result of certain ongoing engagements that were happening at the TCTA, honorable chair, honorable members, um, we only received updated financial statements in October. Um, normally, this process would have been finalized in, in July, um, and we would have issued an audit report in July. Um, but we only finalized the audit report for the TCTA in December, and consequently only finalized the audit report for WTE in Feb, uh, based on the interrelated relationship that I've just explained. The specific challenges that were uh, experienced at the TCTA, we've, we've dealt with um, 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 to, to some degree. Uh, Suffice to say, Honorable Chair, had we closed off the audit at the, at the TCTA at that particular point in time, they would have probably then received a, 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 a limitation uh, outcome, which is, would have been a disclaimer because the amounts are quite, quite material. So the time that we spent additional time did assist in at least um, lessening the, the extent of the, of, the, of the unfavorable audit outcomes. So Honorable Chair, um, this particular paragraph um, we did deal with in sufficient detail when we did the briefing to the um, to to Scopa to to yourselves your your good selves when we did the briefing in in March. Uh, it is a direct um, extraction from the briefing we did. Uh, we just shared the same uh, message with the portfolio committee so that they also obtained the same uh, understanding with regard to uh, the challenges that were faced. Um, just as a way of of reminding ourselves and recapping what those challenges were. Um, we did know the challenges with regard to the implementation of the treaty. The treaty having had been signed in 1986 by the Minister of Water Affairs then um, has obviously been overtaken by current events. We now have a constitution that requires certain responsibilities of our government institutions that was implemented in, in 1996. We have the Public Finance Management Act that also then came in in the early 2000s or, or 1999. Uh, we also have uh, had a significant and continuous improvements and development in the financial reporting requirements like the IFRSs and your grabs. And therefore, uh, we found that uh, in certain instances, what was required there was not always talking to the treaty accounting requirements or being implemented necessarily to, the, to its fullest extent by, by management uh, because of past structural um, arrangements and, and just the way things were, were done in the past. I don't think we kept uh, abreast with the, the, the developments as, as and when they were happening. So some of these challenges are highlighted in the red bullets, honorable chair, honorable members. Um, some of the key things that we noted in this particular environment, which was quite a cause of concern for us, uh, was the fact that in certain instances, the institution being TCTA would pay over money to its counterparts in the Lesotho, which is the Lesotho, um, development, uh, Lesotho Highlands Development Agency, or the LHDA, as it's commonly referred to. But once we've paid over those funds, we did not always ascertain what mechanisms or controls the, the TCTA had in place to make sure that at the end of the day, those advance payments made actually did buy what was intended to have been purchased or acquired to begin with. So everything that they had disclosed in their financial statements as the TCTA only spoke to the budget advance payments that were claimed by the counterpart on the other side. We did not always have that evidence of how um, the money was spent. To that effect, Honorable Chair, we then um, engaged the auditors of the LHDA on the other side to try and at least get some form of uh, comfort or assurance on the amounts that were disclosed by the TCTA. Uh, in a larger degree, from an audit point of view, for the past financial year, we could get some form of assurance in order for us to move uh, uh, on from, 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 from that point and, and at least um, and deal with the point. But there's still a significant shortcoming that must be addressed by, by the institution. I think they've also acknowledged it as, as part of their presentations to oversight committees. Um, then, um, 
to because they were always making releasing payments based on the request for advances and never actually checking the actual expenditure. When we then interrogated the actual expenditure with the auditor on the other side of the LHDA, we identified certain expenditures that related to different financial periods that had been incorrectly accounted for in, 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 in the incorrect accounting periods. So that, that's also a point that they must then go and improve. But for the past financial year, we were able to make those correcting or adjusting journals to an acceptable uh, level. The second point, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, deals with the provision that I mentioned earlier. So in the, during the implementation of the project, um, certain members of the community are displaced. Um, obviously, then you, didn't, you do know, need to make certain provision for, for compensating those um, particular members of, of society um, because you need a particular pathway or a particular spot to implement the project. And um, then the, there was a particular uh, system or method that was supposed to have been applied by the entity to calculate um, what provision would be payable to those particular members of, 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 the, of the Lesotho Society. Um, a number of input factors are considered. Um, the, the person, the size of the um, arable land that is being lost or is grazing land, and there was a particular rate that was then applied based on that size, and you get a particular amount, and that's the amount that then the TCA uh, puts through as a provision in their financial statement. So they have a very good approved policy setting all these things apart, but that policy was not always applied during the actual calculation, and therefore resulted in us being limited to be able to express a view on what they have um, um, included in their financial statement, and it resulted in a qualification matter on this provision um, matter. Then, insofar as it relates to the treaty as well, um, we also noted that the treaty does cater for certain controls to be put in place, one of which is the Lesotho um, Highlands Water Commission. The commission consists of both members from the South African delegation as well as the, um, the Lesotho delegation. Both of, 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 of these members representing the delegation makes up the commission, and the commission then oversees certain governance and transactional aspects like the budget of the, of the project. At the end of the year, the commission is also supposed to take whatever each party has then um, incurred on the project. Actually, they, they first start off by saying what has been spent in totality on the project, and they must then do a, an allocation reconciliation process to say, well, if we spend 100, does 60 relate to the water transfer model, or does 40 relate to the generation of hydroelectricity that is uh, the benefit that Lesotho is, is deriving from this project? And obviously, the water transfer is the benefit that the South African government is deriving from the project. And based on that split and what's been actually incurred, they then say, let's do a proper split of the cost incurred to the respective governments. However, when we were doing the audit, we found that for the past three financial years, um, the TCTA had not received uh, or nor requested uh, the commission for those uh, reports. Um, only once the auditor started engaging and requesting the information, did they receive a document sometime late in September or October of the previous financial year that also assisted in dealing with some of the significant shortcomings we identified, but uh, there's still a two, two year financial um, lag that must, that must still be um, addressed in, in totality. So um, the point there, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, is that the treaty does make provision for certain controls. However, they were not always necessarily followed through. And I am using the word followed through intentionally, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, because one could argue that it's the responsibility of the commission, but we also challenge the institution to say, but you also have not demonstrated to us how you actually went, requested the information from the commission so that we can then say, the commission, you are holding up the, the, the process in this regard. So they couldn't also furnish us with any evidence that they had done those follow-ups themselves, um, apart from when we had asked. Then one uh, other on, on, on bullet point number four, honorable chair, honorable members, one of the shortcomings that we also noted was the fact that even for these reports, when we eventually do receive them, um, it seems that it, it, it was signed off by a particular delegation member. And our interpretation of the controls that were required by the treaty was that um, for it to have valid powers, it needed to have come through the office of the secretary as required by the, the treaty um, articles. So that was our interpretation. And obviously there are certain associated risks that go with that. Um, if a particular report comes signed off by a particular member, 
it could be construed that it then represents the views of a particular member and not necessarily that of the commission or that it's a particular person's um, you know, interpretation of how things are supposed to be implemented and therefore those figures that we then use to rely on could be then the view of a particular individual. And that's just something that we mentioned to, to, to um, the institution for them to take it up with the commission and ensure that the commission then um, and, and enforces the necessary um, compliance requirements in line with the treaty so that um, when a document is issued, it's signed off and, and approved at the appropriately delegated level. It's like us when we go and we do a normal audit, honorable chair, honorable members, um, unless there's a proper delegation saying, this DDG is empowered to sign up this document, we will always look to the accounting officer. And if you look at all our reports, you'll see it's addressed to the accounting officer and the accounting authority because that, in terms of the PFMA, is who the responsible uh, body or entity is that takes accountability for the particular institution. And the last point, Honorable Chair, was even if those reports were received and we took them at face value to say, well, let's try and interrogate them for what they are to see if we can't at least get gain some form of assurance from these reports. Uh, we also still identified that those reports were not always um, thoroughly reviewed and assessed by the institution. So there was a gap or risk that they were taking these reports and just accounting for them in the financial statements. So obviously, if there were any gaps or shortcomings on the report, you would have then had incorrect uh, reporting figures included in your financial statements. Honorable Chair, yeah, somebody's putting up, uh, somebody else is sharing. I think that's um, uh, Stephen, who's my colleague, who's going to take over the presentation um, from this point on end. Um, I appreciate um, the engagement for now, Honorable Chair, and I will hand over to Mr. Kaleli, who will take over the, the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Chair. All right, that's fine. You can proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm actually not the one uh, projecting. Uh, can I still project over? I think it's one of the of the committee members who's currently projecting. All right, IT, can you um, assist in that regard um, so that we manage our time? Uh, Chi, whoever is projecting is to unproject, unshare. All right, who, who is overriding us here? Sis Ndombi, is that you? No, oh, Chair. I think it's Sianda. It's not me either. No, it's not me either, Chair. Sianda, yes, sir. I'll just, no, it's not me, Chair. Let, let me try, Chair, see if I can't override. Okay, I think please do that. I have just shared it, uh, Chair. Would you please confirm if you can see it on? Yes, there is something here. Screen. Just uh, enlarge it. There we go. All right. Colleagues, are we fine? All right. You can proceed, Bob. Good to go. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, BE. -B I think uh, the, the current slide. Uh, talks to the credible and the fi of, of the financial and performance reporting. Uh, this is just where chair and honourable members we look at uh, at uh, at the financial statements that were presented for audit and the performance info uh, uh, performance reports that was presented for audit whether they had any form of of uh, of errors prior to, to to the submission and i think the importance of this is always to ensure that the information that is submitted for audit is usually the information that management uses uh, as their day-to-day -day decision making tools and the concern around that is always to say if we pick up corrections or errors out of the the, the the financial statements and the reports that are being submitted, uh, it, 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 it's possible that management has been using uh, such information to actually make their decisions, uh, which could result in, in uh, decisions that are made on information that is not necessarily accurate. Um, Chair, and with your permission, then I will move on, Chair, to the next 
to the next one, to the next slide. And uh, it should show up now. And the next slide uh, is the one for, the, for compliance with legislation. When we look at compliance and legislation, still looking at those entities that the BE was referring to, you will take a note that in the 1819 um, audit outcomes, all of them had actually some non-compliances to, 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 to legislation and prescripts. And if you look at on the right on the details that we have provided, we have provided your top five non-compliances that we have identified. And in, in the, at the end of each nature of non-compliance, we have included the... The, the entities to which it specifically applies to. So if you look at the first bullet, talks to the quality of the financial statements that was presented, and that was evident in the department and the two entities with the exception of, T, of WC, WRC. There was also non-compliance uh, with the prevention of irregular expenditure because the PFMA requires the accounting authority and the accounting officer to put in place controls to ensure that they do not incur uh, irregular expenditures. And the moment that we identify the irregular expenditures and they get disclosed, we there's immediately an indication of the non-compliance with that section that requires the prevention part of it. Uh, similarly, so with the fruitless and wasteful expenditures uh, that that we we picked up on those three specific entities that included in brackets on that other side. The other area that we also looked at is the uh, consequence management, uh, honorable chair, and there we would have identified instances of, of not effecting to the fullest the uh, consequence management in within the department as well as within the WRC. And then the other ones is obviously the, whether the grants were spent for the intended purpose, which that one only happens with in the department and the payments within 30 days, uh, honorable chair. You'll see that the very last paragraph there, that's just where we are alluding to the fact you'd recall that the BE indicated Only looking at the, the 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 compliance part, so we would audit the compliance part, and then after we raise the concerns and the issues, and we've engaged management on them, and we've agreed or disagreed with management, then we would hand them over to 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 Ernest and Young, who were the signatory of the of the audit report in that in the in the prior year. And uh, then I will move to the next. So the next one, Chair, that would be reflecting on the status of the internal controls. So as part of our audit, what we also do, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members, is we always reflect on what are the internal control areas that we feel have contributed and have um, resulted in the audit outcomes that we, would, that we are sharing. And we would have picked a lot of issues or around the leadership, I think in particular, the leadership within the department. In our next slide, we will reflect in much more details when we look at the, the position of the accounting officer and the extent to which there has been uh, some uh, the accounting officer in an acting pos in, in an acting role. And equally so, we look at your normal normal reconciliation processes, the comparison of information that you receive to make sure that ultimately the information that you that you that you present in the set of financial statements is accurate so you would need to have those daily monitoring controls those review and approvals at different levels we would also find that those were not happening you would recall that the the uh, the B has already spoken to uh, the reconciliations that were not adequately happening between the information that was moving between the water trading entity as well as the TCC and equally so between the TCTA and the LHDA, which is their the counterpart in Lesotho, as well as even between the, 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 
the, the Lesotho Highlands Water Commission. So it is it talks to those um, inadequacies in the in the processes and in the review and the monitoring areas around 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 the, the internal controls. And uh, you would see honorable chair, honorable members, when you reflect on the governance area, the governance area is the one that you find that uh, has got a bigger share or a bigger bar of green that talks to the to to water resource commission DWS and WTE, and where we still have a little bit of TCTA still lagging uh, that's sitting on 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 an, on an on a yellow area. So this is when we then reflect on the internal controls and say what is what what are the areas that we foresee that would have contributed towards towards the results that we are sharing honorable chair the next slide as i as i alluded to honorable chair then in on this slide we would want to reflect for uh, the extent to which uh, the accounting officer position within the department was occupied by an acting uh, role and where it was not an acting role the extent to which it was and you will see that uh, predominantly honorable chair and honorable members the role of the accounting officer within the department has been occupied by an acting uh, personnel and i think we're not necessarily saying that by acting that uh, the pe the incumbent in the acting position might not uh, do what is supposed to be done. We are just highlighting the fact that when you act, in most cases, you are acting from a position, a particular position that's lower than the position that you are acting in. And in in that instance, you'll find that you're actually being held, you're, you're actually holding accountable your peers, and which at times becomes a bit of a challenge. Uh, and uh, you'll, you'll in most instances find that uh, the person does not apply themselves in as full as they would have would they have been actually uh, appointed in those positions and that is why we highlight this in particular uh, uh, we highlight it here particularly and also given the the history of the outcomes of the of of of, of the audit outcomes of the department this is still more or less in sync with with the um, with those outcomes and illustrates and demonstrates the the, the the disposition that we want to highlight, Honorable Chair. Uh, and then Honorable Chair, I would like, with your permission, to move then to slide 17. I hope it has already reflected uh, on, on your site. And on this one particular chair, we are, uh, it's this slide together with slide number 18, we are reflecting on the extent of spend in the program versus -vis the extent of achievement in that program. We also reflect and highlight, Honorable Chair, on whether we have identified any irregular as well as fruitless and wasteful expenditures within that program. And we also indicate whether there were any material misstatements that we had identified in the financial statements related to that project. And if you look at at the, uh, the status or uh, the way we would read this um, table, Honorable Chair, taking program three as a case in point, you will see that the budget spent was 98.3% of the budget and the actual achievement of the targets or out of that program would, would be sitting at about 50% and whether we identified any irregular expenditures yes we identified any fruitless and wasteful expenditures yes as well as material misstatements that would have come out of um, the audit of the financial statements and that is the message that we want to highlight here for all these uh, programs uh, that would be program four as well as program two and then on program one there with a purple a purple uh, highlight on the comment side that is just to highlight that that one although we noted this specific thing it was not necessarily selected specifically for for audit purposes because it's usually administration and it is covered in the normal audit of the the full extent of the financial statements 
So that is what uh, this particular slide 17 as well as slide 18 talks, talks to, slide 18 focusing specifically on the grants and, um, and the extent as well of, 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 of the spending on, on these grants. And you will see that, Honorable Chair, when you look at, at the, the very last bottom um, part of that slide where we indicate that um, the, the, the extent to which the spending was done on the specific grants being regional bulk infrastructure grant as well as the water services infrastructure grant where they were not necessarily done in accordance with the Division of Revenue Act. And, uh, <clears throat> and as a result, also underspending that was incurred in that regard. And with your permission then, Chair, I will move on to the next slide and I will deal with slide 19 together with, with slide 20. And those ones we are looking now at the, proje at the projects. So on the, on the above slide 17 and 18, we were looking at it from a program level. And then we said, we, through our, our value add audit that we do, let us now reflect on each specific projects, not each in totality, but those that are material and those that we could at least be able to perform a full on audit on them, looking at budgeting, looking at the expenditure, looking at compliance, as well as the predetermined objectives thereof, and also picking or highlighting out any issues of irregular expenditures and fruitless and wasteful that were identified in that specific program uh, project. So in this case, Chair, we will use, for example, the water, the war on leaks project. When you look at the war on leaks project, you will see that there were budgeting problem, uh, challenges, particularly because we know that um, the war on leaks project, when it was initiated, it was never included in the budget. And as a result of not having included it in the budget, uh, it, it, it initially came out chair because of a, 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 a deviation that the department had sought to, to try and address, which was of an emergency in nature. However, out of that emergency in nature, then this project was, was birthed and that, then it was incurred without any there was expenditure that was incurred on it without necessarily any budgets that were allocated to it. When you look at, for example, <clears throat> whether there were any financial issues that were coming out of war on leaks, there were issues that were coming out of out of that in particular because initially it started, it, the spending started within the water trading entity and later on moved on into the main account. And in our engagements with the, the entity we had uh, particularly taken a stance of understanding whether this project was within their direct mandate and I think in our engagements with them together with the engagements that ultimately happened with National, National Treasury it was indicated that this project is much more uh, specifically it can be located easily and specific to the main account and not necessarily to the water trading entity. We also identified some compliance and uh, non-compliances on the war on leaks and there was irregular expenditures that were coming out of out of war out of uh, this project and as well from a predetermined objectives because of not allocating budget to it and not necessarily including any items of targets in the predetermined objectives initially we indicated that but also even as the progressed to, to try and incorporate the project into their annual performance plan, you still find that they do not necessarily achieve the intended targets that they would have planned to achieve on the project. So that is a reflection, Chair, that we do on all those other projects in that very same light that we just uh, shared now with Warren Leaks, but it applies to all those other projects, your budget, budget eradication, your Mopani emergency that we know very well about, uh, uh, etc. Chair, and uh, that deals now. When you come to slide 20, honourable chair, and honourable members, that is now where we have included the details uh, of those specific findings, and you will see that I have already talked.
to the Warren League project that was then. We have identified that the project was an intervention, however, not included in the budget, and uh, there was irregular expenditures that were identified due to non-SCM processes that were not followed adequately in the APPs. While it was not included at first, subsequent to its inclusion, the, 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 the department also did still not achieve the intended targets that they had planned for. So the slide uh, 18 then, uh, this slide rather, 20 then gives us the details as compared to the picture that we have reflected just now on in slide number 19. With your permission, Chair, then I will move over to slide 21. Slide 21, we're still doing exactly the same process of comparison. Here we're just focusing on the TCTA one. You will see that in particular the specific project that we looked at for TCTA was the acid mine drainage as well where we had some uh, budgetary issues that we that we had identified, financial challenges, non-compliances, irregular as well as predetermined objectives that we have uh, also identified and noted on that project. And as well, when you reflect on the overall achievement of the objectives within that were planned for by the TCTA, you will see that there were still some bits of challenges. If you look at, for example, on objective three there, they, they would have achieved about 67%. They would have incurred some irregular expenditures uh, as we have highlighted in the in 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 in, in that uh, allocated space, and there was no material misstatements that were noted from the financial statement element part of it that uh, that that were identified, and that is the information that we wanted to share there, as well as consistently program one because objective one rather because it talks to the aspects that are usually covered within the financial statement audit then we, let, we, we, do, we did not select that part for audit. And uh, with your indulgence, Honorable Chair, I will then move over to slide 23. And on slide 23, together with slide 24, that is where we're reflecting on the financial health of the entities that, and we're still looking uh, on the four entities that we we, 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 we are still dissecting the outcomes from. And if you look at it, we look at the areas around expenditure management. We look at whether the entities would be paying their normal uh, obligations when they, they fall due within 30 days as prescribed, as well as we look at whether there are any uh, assets and liability management challenges. We also look at the cash stance of, of the entities and then I'll talk to the last one there on the default event at a, just after I deal with this other with this other three. So on expenditure management, we would have identified that for both the department and the entity, they took longer to actually pay the service providers after the services were already received. And this still talks to the financial difficulty and the financial challenge that both the department and the water trading entity found themselves in. When you look at uh, the second layer of the asset management, you'll see that the current liabilities uh, exceeded the current assets for the in, within the department environment. And uh, you will see that with the water trading entity, there's always the challenge of um, a slow recovery of the, the, the money that is locked within the receivables. So the, 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 the service providers that, to whom the trading entity would have provided water take long to actually pay the debt that uh, they they would have incurred as a result of that to the extent that they would take at about 108 uh, or so days to actually pay that and that puts pressure obviously on the cash flows of the entity and in turn if the entity does not collect all these data it puts strain on them to also meet the objectives and the commitments uh, that they need to do for the TCTA. And when you look at specifically the cash management area, you find that both the department as well as the entity uh, found themselves in, in an overdraft uh, position. And 
understand that both the department and the entity are not by prescript allowed to be in that position. And uh, this has been now going on for approximately about three financial years that they find themselves in this position. Uh, you'll see that it is almost stabilizing for the for the entity there around 1.4 million uh, in that position. Uh, the, the, the entity had initially entered into what we regard as a gentleman's agreement with the National Treasury because National Treasury as well could not condone this because this was out of uh, the ordinary given that an entity is not supposed to borrow money altogether per prescript. To, to try and reduce that, that overdraft over a period of time and uh, that initial plan also did not materialize on a chair and that was due to obviously the strain that the entity still found itself in around the collecti collecting the, the, the income, around spending on projects that were not necessarily part of what lied within their direct mandate. And as a result, in one of the, the agreements that National Treasury had indicated there was that uh, the entity needs to, 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 to stop paying all the projects that did not fall directly within their mandate in order to ensure that at least they can recover from this position that they are currently in. So on that last one, Honorable Chair of the default event, when we were auditing the TCTA from a ratios point of view, you'll see that the the health status of the TCTA is a good health, it's in a good financial health status. However, what it what we also picked up was in some of the <clears throat> in some of the uh, the the uh, in some of the the agreements that they had with the lenders. The lenders were specific that the entity the, the TCTA should not result should not obtain an a, a, an unqualified or a qualified rather a financial audit outcome and where that happens that would automatically result in a default event however the the lenders still had the the the, the right to exercise the to to recall the 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 funds that they would have issued as a result of this event default. So the lenders included this default event in the agreements that they signed with the entity. And when it happened, because then it was qualified. So because it was qualified, we it then invoked this default event. But there was still a decision that each lender would have to take to decide whether am I recalling or not recalling. And because at the time of us completing and signing off this audit report, we had picked up that that thing was a default event. Even though the engagements had not yet happened, we saw it prudent to actually reflect it in our audit report so that we communicate to the users of the financial statements to say TCTA, by virtue of reading the agreements that they have signed with the lenders, ought not to achieve a qualified opinion because if they do, it throws them into a default event. And in that space, the lenders have got the first right of deciding how to go about when the default happens. And they can, uh, Honorable Chair, as I indicated, even uh, go to the extent of actually recalling the, 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 the loans that they would have given to TCTA. And in the event that they would have, they would recall those loans, we are talking about 26 odd billion that would need to be paid and in this case it would also extend to to the fiscals to ensure that treasury comes up with some way of rescuing the situation and that was why we included in particular this note in our audit report to reflect on the state the the, the, the fact that the default event has happened although the lender still had uh, an opportunity to decide wh which way they could they would go given that it, it, it has happened and um, on slide 24 honorable chair that's where we just now reflecting on the uh, over time on the movement of the surplus within the department as well as 
the entity as well as on the cash stance. So when you look at <clears throat> there on the very first top one, when you look at that blue line, that's where you start looking at the movement of the cash position of the department over a period of time. And the orange one or the yellowish one would then look at the movement of the, 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 the surplus or the deficit uh, in the income statement. And the bottom one then talks to the what to the trading entity, still looking at the same things and still consistent in terms of the colors uh, on the movements of those two specific things, uh, Honorable Chair. With your permission, Honorable Chair, then I'll move to slide number 25. <clears throat> slide number 25 just looks at the unauthorized expenditure. And here, Honorable Chair, I'll just go quickly because in the current 1819 financial year, there was no unauthorized expenditure that was incurred. However, the department still had some unauthorized expenditures that were coming from prior years uh, that still required uh, um, consideration for condonation. And uh, that is uh, what we are reflecting on this one. And we also wanted to indicate whether the, 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 the unauthorized expenditure has been investigated or not investigated, which we depict there with the green bars that it has been uh, uh, investigated. It predominantly resulted in prior years as a result of the overspending that the department had in the bucket eradication pro program uh, that they had. And I will then move, Honorable Chair, to the next slide, which is slide number 26. Slide number 26 looks at the fruitless and wasteful expenditure, and we look at it uh, as well over the next over the two years. And there you would see that, and we see that we reflect on the nature of uh, what drives this fruitless and wasteful expenditure. We also reflect on whether it has been investigated or not yet investigated. And you'll see that the nature of what drove these fruitless and wasteful expenditures would have been the long pay, the, the not paying the suppliers on time, as we have already discussed under the non-compliance or not paying the, your, your suppliers within 30 days. And if you don't do that, you start incurring interest. That interest becomes fruitless and, and wasteful expenditure at the point that you actually pay it. And the other thing that also happened, and this happened in the space of the trading entity, it's on the standing time that um, now was happening within the unit of construction that is within the department. So the challenge that, that had happened is given the, the strained financial uh, position that the entity found itself in, it it could not provide materials, it could not provide equipment at specific projects that needed to happen, whilst there were still people that were allocated uh, for their labor purposes to be there on those projects. So you find that because they had not, they did not have any materials or equipment to work on, then they would remain idling on the projects. And as a result, they would drive still expenditure of payment to, to the contractors, but not delivery on the project. And it resulted then in the, <clears throat> in the fruitless and wasteful expenditure. And we also indicate to what extent it would have been investigated and wh at what extent it wouldn't be investigated, uh, Honorable Chair. And if I move on to the next slide, Honorable Chair, being slide 27. Slide 27 talks to <clears throat> To the irregular expenditure, equally we still reflect on it over the two years. We still reflect on the nature of that irregular expenditure. We reflect as well as whether it has been investigated or not investigated, uh, Honorable Chair. And you will see that under the nature of uh, irregular expenditures, that's where we lift the challenge that the department had experienced under the, the implementing agents' um, space where the implementing agents would procure without necessarily following proper uh, SEM processes or once they receive an instruction from the department, they interpret it as an emergency and they go without uh, ob observing the rest of, 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 of the supply chain processes and they start just to deviate from the onset. 
And equally so, we also reflected on uh, the irregularities that would have happened within the TCTA, where we noted that with TCTA, mostly or the majority irregular expenditures that would have come out would be where they also um, uh, deviate or increase the, they vary the, the project value without necessarily obtaining the necessary pre-approvals that ought to be re, uh, 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 received prior to the actual prior to the actual variation. And in this instance, in, in this instance, uh, we had a long and extensive engagements with the um, the entity, and it demonstrated that some of the, these things come as a result of the nature of the work that they do. That at a construction level, when a an engineer encounters a particular uh, challenge that was not necessarily included within the specs of the pro of the project, then as they apply themselves to it. Immediately, they start incurring irregular expenditure if that amount that they are spending there exceeds a particular threshold that would have either required the accounting authority to pre-approve or would have required National Treasury to pre-approve prior to them uh, spending there. We have subsequent to that encouraged them to engage with National Treasury so that National Treasury can understand their predicament and perhaps guide and direct them in how to move forward in that regard. But as it stands, honorable chair, honorable members, it is a expenditure that was incurred in contravention with the prescripts that were uh, put in place uh, that we were auditing with at the moment. And uh, we also then reflect, honorable chair, on whether these have been investigated or not investigated and you can see that the majority for the 1718 financial year still remained in the red at the time of us preparing the report where they were not yet investigated or the investigations were not yet completed at that time and with your permission now uh, honorable chair we move now into the water bots into the water bot space and um, as the BE had already indicated that we have a similar slide to the one that we had up there when we were looking at these four specific entities. So here we looked at all these water bores, uh, uh, Honorable Chair, and the majority of actually all these water bores, Honorable Chair, in the year that we are looking at were audited by the Office of the Auditor General. And uh, when you look at the picture, Honorable Chair, you will see that uh, there was what I would call a slight improvement in the sense that both City Bank and Lepelle Water, which were qualified in the prior financial year, in the 1819 audit outcomes, actually received an unqualified audit opinion. And they improved honorable chair because they actually took uh, cognizance of the recommendations that we had and uh, in put in place the action plans that were effective enough and efficient to actually drive the, the outcomes and improve the outcomes. Uh, they would even they had even requested us specifically to come interrogate the details of their of of how they have corrected the, the issues prior to the audit uh, commencing, so that we can give them a bit of assurance on whether they have dealt adequately and sufficiently with the issues that we had identified. And as a result, it is commended that they have managed to move out of a qualification zone into an unqualified zone. The one that still remains honorable chair in the qualification area, it's the CDBM water board honorable chair. And uh, when you look specifically in detail around the areas in which they received a qualification as a result of, you will see that there are two in particular which are recurring, and that is the completeness of irregular expenditure as well as on receivables. So on those ones, they had already in the prior year, whilst they were still sitting in a qualification area, had uh, obtained a, a qualification on these specific areas. And as a result, we deemed them as recurring. And it also then has additional issues that were identified within PPE, payables, commitments, and deferred uh, income, as well as an aggregate one, honorable chair. And when we look deeper and we try and 
sit back and reflect on the, the root causes around these qualifications. Again, we fall back to some illig- for some le- leadership instability that we noted in the in the in the entity uh, with regards to the CE- CEO position, where the, actually the CFO was now the acting the acting CEO, and uh, equally so, you'll find that those internal controls, the financial management processes that needs to happen regularly and frequently were also not uh, observe, observed at all times. And that is what drives that Citibank still remains in that in that area of a qualification, uh, Honorable Chair. Drives and that Citibank still remains in that, in that area and, of uh, qualification. When we go further, Honorable Chair, to the next slide, that's where we also reflect on the compliance area, as well as uh, on the predetermined objectives now of the water boards. When you look at uh, this, this looks like a much busy slide, but I'll try to talk to it, Honorable Chair, with, uh, so that I can guide the members in how they uh, they, they move within the, the the slide. On the very first top corner on the, on the left, it reflects the compliance results. And there you will see both 18, 19, and 17, 18 remained constant or stagnant, where we had 100% non-compliance from all the entities. And just underneath that pictorial picture there, we have a detailed explanations on some of the areas that uh, resulted in the non-compliances. So you'll see that again, the preparation of financial statements, as we had alluded on the other four above, also remained a concern around uh, the water boards, where all the water boards had 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 that non-compliance. We also reflect on SCM non-compliances and in, in its various uh, forms, honourable chair. And we also talk to the prevention of irregular expenditure as well as uh, fruitless and wasteful expenditures. And then on the top right, on that pictorial there, that is where we then look at the quality, the very first one prior to the dotted divider, we look at the quality of the annual performance report that was submitted as well, uh, uh, plans, uh, Honorable Chair, the quality of the annual performance plans that was submitted, as well as then on the other side, uh, towards the further right, where we look at the quality of the APR, the annual performance report that was uh, provided uh, for audit. And here you will see that honorable chair, the picture is somewhat uh, in in between almost uh, when you come to to the quality of the APRs that were uh, that were submitted for audit. You'll see that we have about uh, a good 50, 50 or fifty five percent of the ones that were found not to still meet the the requirements of of, of the the frameworks. And uh, when we look at the annual performance. Uh, plans that one was to a lesser extent at about 33 uh, percent of 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 deficiencies that we had noted. Again, similar in the same form at just underneath that pictorial p- picture, we look at the what the the water board specifically, and we look at the nature and the areas around where they were found not to have adhered fully to their to the to the frameworks that are applicable. And we have mentioned there that your Le Pelle would not have done well under the strategic objective one, Chatuze strategic objective 13, uh, uh, etc. And uh, with uh, overback on objective seven, the honorable chair. So that is where we then look at this overall picture and we sit back and we say, what is the state of compliance within the water boards? And what is the status uh, of of, 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 of the annual performance plan together with the annual performance reports that were submitted to for audit. With your permission, Chair, then I will move to the next slide on the <clears throat> irregular and fruitless and wasteful expenditures. And here again, Chair, we look at, uh, we try to reflect on the nature of the of the irregular expenditures that were incurred, as well as the fruitless uh, and wasteful expenditures. Here, you will see, Honorable Chair, that we have not necessarily reflected on 
whether these have been investigated or not yet investigated or whether the investigations were, st were still in progress. That is the information that we would collate during the current course, during the current audit of, of, the, of the water boards. So when we audit in the current year, which is still going to start giving the, 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 the year end difference, then that is where we will look at whether they had initiated and completed the irregular uh, the investigations related to these specific years that we are looking at here above. And when you look at <clears throat> on, on the irregular expenditures that, that are incurred around here, again, Honorable Chair, still the non-compliances on procurement processes that we still pick up, that we also still pick up that there are payments that are made not in line with the contracts, Honorable Chair, and uh, where the contract terms and the payment also differ, we also still again look at non-compliance with uh, National Treasury regulations. We identified again as well overpayments over and above um, the contract amount as well as variations that were not approved at the right uh, level and in the, by, the, by the right, uh, by the authorized uh, personnel. And those are the natures of the things that we still have noted there. You will see when we reflect on the irregular expenditure, we highlight the fact that um, it should still be borne in mind that when it comes to CD Bank, that we had still qualified the irregular expenditure note uh, as a result of um, uh, 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 the challenges that we identified around the completeness thereof of the disclosures in that in that case. And for the fruitless and wasteful expenditure, Honorable Chair, you'll see that um, most of the uh, the water boards, it's it's towards the settlement of agreements with executives and uh, and and CEOs there, and then with the others also uh, being fruitless and wasteful expenditures that we incurred around the Umgeni as well as around the Citibank, uh, the Citibank water board. Uh, one honorable chair uh, honorable chair i think on this one what we perhaps need to do subsequent to this is we will with your permission honorable chairs it's provide you with the uh, detailed in writing of which uh, water board incurred how much so that you can have a picture of or a breakdown of these figures and you are able to link them directly to to each water board uh, because we had not included this information in this presentation chair that we have here in front of you. Uh, on All right, that's fine, you can do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chair. And then at this point, Honorable Chair, <clears throat> I will hand over back to uh, my the BE, Andri Sekheto, so that he can deal with the presentation of the uh, amendments of the PAA. Act with your permission, Honorable Chair. I thank you. Um, all right, that's fine. But we have received a, a, a briefing on the PAA. Um, so I think members are quite aware with that. Um, unless there's something specific to uh, water and sanitation in the water boards. Uh, PAA? Thank you, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members. Um, no, Honorable Chair, there's absolutely nothing uh, specific. Um, I think, but what, 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 what? Um, if I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of my colleague, but what, what we usually do is we um, are so used to Scopa not dealing with overall um, outcomes. Um, Scopa normally requires detail, you know. Um, so, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members normally would say, give us a list of of the suppliers with the contract amounts so that we can follow up with the institutions. And so we do have the breakdown that is included in the other briefing note, but should there be any other uh, detail or information that is required from the committee or by the committee, the committee is always just more than welcome to um, then communicate that question to us. Thank you, um, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members. Um, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, um, is everybody still with us? Yeah, no, we are here. Thank, thank you, Chair. For, for a moment there, when I asked that question, I almost, um, 
thought of, of reciting, um, you know, the, the Kirk Franklin song where he says, GP, are you with me? And everybody goes, oh, yeah. Uh, but it's just on a lighter note, um, Honorable Chair. <laughs> Honorable Honourable Chair, Honourable Members, um, I will now deal with the slide. Uh, that, that we literally just have about 10 minutes to go, Honourable Chair, Honourable Members. Um, can I get an explicit confirmation whether my screen is visible that I'm sharing with you, Honourable Chair, Honourable Members? We're seeing your face. Uh, you have not okay. shared anything. Okay, let's, let's try that once again, Honourable Chair, Honourable Members. Um, how about now, Honourable Chair, Honourable Members? No, I'm seeing you and Mum Tolasha. Uh, right, all right, there you go, Andres, shoot. Thank you, Chair. Um, Honourable Chair, Honourable Members, towards the tail end of our presentation, um, obviously we've given you the audit outcomes. What we were always asked as, a, as, a, as, a, as the National um, Audit Office, BCS AG, you've conducted your audits, you have given us the reports, but what now? So there was always that missing a little bit of, of a gap, if I can refer to it in that manner. And to that uh, effect, the Office of the AG then had an expansion of its mandate, where the Public Audit Act was amended to include the following information that is now depicted on the, on the screen. So, Honorable Chair, Honorable me Members, the long and short of the amendments boil down to our ability now as an office uh, the, the, the National Audit Office to be able to include and report on work done uh, regarding material irregularity. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time, like Chair said, um, the, the, the broad definition of material irregularity just means that now uh, when we conduct our audits, which is quite important because our core mandate is still to conduct an audit in line with the Constitution, but however, as and when we conduct the audit and we identify any transaction or incident that means the definition that is uh, disclosed or, or contained there next to the red dot, that would then trigger the following three actions that are included in the bottom. So as and when we test, we identify any non-compliance with or a contravention of a legislation, any fraud, theft, or breach of a fiduciary duty that we've identified during the audit that is likely to result or has already resulted in a material financial loss, a misuse or loss of material public resource or substantial harm to the, to the institution or the general public, uh, it would then meet the definition of a material irregularity. Once we then have the material irregularity, honorable chair, honorable members, that process will then trigger another process of engagement. It is exactly like the audit uh, process. So there will be an opportunity provided for the accounting officer or the accounting authority to also put through their view. So the whole principle of being administratively fair and just so they'll be provided with an opportunity to, to air their views. So the Audi Altrum Partum principle will still apply. They will be given sufficient opportunity to provide any representation, supporting documents uh, to refute the uh, irregularity that would have been identified. So honorable chair, honorable members, if the accounting officer or such an authority uh, then does not deal appropriately with that irregularity that's been noted or reported to them, then the mandate will allow us to take action in the following three avenues. So we can refer the material irregularity to any relevant public institution or body with the necessary requisite investigative skills. So that would be your public protector, your SIU, um, et cetera, the Hawks, et cetera. Even uh, SEPs, if I'm not mistaken, is also included as a, as, a, as a public body for which we can refer. Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, this would then obviously need to have some form of element of um, uncertainty or criminality, because obviously we are auditors, we are not trained as forensic um, um, investigators. So if we realize that there may be, there might be a need for these specialized skills, we will do those referrals um, in that regard. Should we then realize that actually what we have in front of us is quite clear cut and that the evidence presented speaks for itself, then the Office of the AG can then make a remedial binding recommendation in its uh, audit report. So we will say accounting officer, accounting authority, for next year we've identified this issue, you agree that it's an issue, so therefore go and take action as required by either the PFMA or the MFMA or whatever other relevant piece of legislation we then apply um, in line with your responsibilities and ensure that you then take the necessary required action. Should that particular um, accounting officer or accounting authority fail, it would then trigger the next step, which is the last 
uh, resort where now we have been given sufficient opportunity to act on that particular incident where the state had either suffered a loss or resource was misused. We make a determination through a established process and then the office of the AG issues a certificate of debt and that certificate of debt is issued in the name of the accounting officer because as I've alluded to earlier, the middle step is the accounting officer would have been provided with sufficient opportunity to go and take action and therefore failure to take action would then uh, make the accounting officer or accounting authority liable. Accounting authorities, honorable chair, honorable members are normally boards headed up by a number of people. So in that instance, uh, when you compare it vis-a-vis -vis an accounting officer, which is a particular uh, individual, uh, in this instance, the board would become individually and collectively liable as uh, the accounting officer uh, in the individual sense. So now that we understand uh, in, in terms of a reminder of the Public Audit Act uh, amendments, Honorable Chair, last year we phased in the Public Audit Act amendments. So uh, the Office of the AG identified 16 audits. We did audits there. Um, and um, I'm, I'm just going to, to, to go to the slide. It's of slide 35, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members. From those audits that we phased in, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, we identified 28 material irregularities from 12 completed audits. So which means by the time we cut off the reporting process in October, there were 28 MIs on the table. Just from those 28 MIs, it was established, and this is established, determined, uh, already confirmed, 2.9 billion worth of financial loss, or 2.8 billion worth of financial loss. So, Honorable, Honorable Chair, already exceeding 2 billion just from 28 MIs on just 16 audits. And if you look at the landscape of the, of the, of the public institutions out there, the Office of the AG probably has more than 900 um, audits for which we are responsible for if you combine the entire provincial, national, and local government sphere. So just from 12 completed audits, already 12, 2.8 billion worth of financial loss that, that, was, that was determined. What was the nature of, 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 of the material irregularities which were identified? We identified unfair uh, and un comparative procurement processes which then resulted in overpricing. So Chair, if you, if you recall the, the, the previous presentation or the, uh, the slide I dealt with, the definition said you must have the non-compliance, but it also it needs to have an impact. And the impact was a financial loss or, or misuse or misappropriation of an asset. So in this instance, if you look at the presentation, Honorable Chair, the non-compliance is you engaged in unfair or uncompetitive procurement processes in contravention of the supply chain management rules, so there's your non-compliance, but that resulted in the goods that you then uh, subsequently procured, you paying inflated pricing, and that was to the tune of 400 million for, for those um, oddities that were part of the phasing. And so the uh, analysis goes all the way to the right where unfair processes resulted in uh, we, uh, the entities appointing a service provider that did not ultimately deliver what they had promised to do in terms of uh, what they had been appointed to do. Uh, payment for goods or services that were not received at all. Uh, we also paid for uh, certain uh, projects or, or, or work where the quality was of a inferior quality and, and, and therefore resulted in us in often circumstances having to go back and rectify certain work. And then also invoices or claims not paid in time so the invoices or the claims not paid in time is not the actual sin itself, but it's the consequential impact thereof that now you incur standing time, uh, penalties, and, 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 and et cetera. So from a water and sanitation point of view, the water and sanitation portfolio was also part of the phase in rollout, honorable chair, honorable members. So we selected both the DWS and the WTE, so the department and the trading entity, and those findings right at the bottom of the screen are the ones that are specifically relating to uh, these institutions. So, so, so in the build environment, we had made payments to contractors for uh, standing time and interest where, for projects that, have, that were um, um, halted. Um, we also made certain consultative uh, or consultation payments to a consulting firm for um, certain work where there was no clear evidence of that. Um, I think the DG also mentioned it in some of the some other presentations. Uh, and then also um, from a WTE point of view, um, they were not collecting and billing uh, certain people for water usages as required. And therefore um, they were not um, ensuring that they were collecting 
all revenue due to the state to an estimated value of 346 million. They are following up and they are making sure that they are issuing those invoices um, subsequently. The reason why we can say that, honorable chair, honorable members, is if you look at the very last comment there, um, what gives us a sense of comfort for now is that the accounting officer was busy investigating in his representations when we reported these irregularities. And for us now, will be to do the follow up when we uh, recommence the audit um, um, as, as we ease the lockdown regulations. Um, so at, at that point, when we were engaging with the accounting officer, he had started instituting the investigations. When we go back, we'll just look at the veracity, the rigor, and the support, and the process that was followed with regard to those investigations and whether they were appropriately uh, dealt with to deal with the material irregularity. Having also said that, honorable chair, honorable members, um, from the office of the AG, um, let's also do a bit of balanced reporting. From those material irregularities we had identified, at least 90% or 89% of, of, of the accounting officers for those irregularities had taken appropriate action at the, at the stage when we reported. So yes, we uncovered the things, but uh, from the evidence that was presented at that stage, the accounting officers were uh, heading in the right direction. We will just do proper follow-ups um, uh, in terms of- having problems. Problems. Thank you. Thank you. Am, I, am I audible now, Honorable Chair? Yes, you are. I'm not sure what's happening. Thank you. I think maybe the chair is, is experiencing some challenges. I was just checking. There seems to be a, a break connection. Is it on my side or is it? Is everybody fine? Uh, it looks like I, I also fine, cannot hear him properly, chair. He's breaking up. Okay, honorable chair. Yes, I think honorable they, members. A Am I more audible now, honorable chair, honorable, pro, uh, honorable members? Yes. Thank you. We just have three slides to, to continue, so I'll quickly run through them before we encounter any more technological gremlins. Um, honorable chair, honorable members. Yeah, please. So obviously, we've given. With these uh, material irregularities presentation, so. Um, the, 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 the next slide deals with the root causes. So we've done our work, we've given you the outcomes, and now obviously the picture is not looking good. There are a number of unfavorable audit outcomes, and we have to give you, you can, uh, uh, our assessment. Up, uh, Thank you, Chair. So um, what, we, what we identified is that um, the three main root causes that resulted in the unfavorable audit outcomes, slow response, uh, management is not always uh, moving with the necessary required speed to implement um, the recommendations and improve key controls to address those risky areas. And honorable chair, honorable members, you'll see the, 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 the slide refers to nine entities. This is now a combination of the, the initial 31 March uh, uh, portfolio audits as well as the water boards, including the, the water boards. Um, inadequate consequences for poor performance and transgressions, that was noted at 12 of, of these institutions, of the 13 institutions that we've reported to you on today. Instability of vacancies, we've spoken, Stephen has mentioned the instability at the board level, CFO level, CEO level, DG level, DDG level across the portfolio. Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, um, the next slide is obviously there must be something that is um, looked at from an improvement point of view. Uh, we give uh, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, just a high level synopsis of the preventative controls and the focus that the institution should then uh, implement to ensure improvement in audit outcomes. What is key there, Honorable Chair, is you'd note that that arrow says 30 April 2020. So if we look at the status of the portfolio, the entire portfolio, the all 13 institutions, the department and the water boards, our assessment currently is that there's still a lot of red on the red right hand side, the honeycomb. There, there must still be some work that must be engaged in to ensure that we don't fall in the same pitfalls for the current financial year to obtain unfavorable audit outcomes. Then, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, on the left hand side of that screen, but, um, where we have the blue light. Yes, Chen? I'm listening, Chen. I, I, I'm listening, but you seem to be breaking. Okay, okay Chen, how about now, Chen? 
I think we are. I think we are losing you there. Colleagues will advise if it's just on my side since you know my challenge is here. Chair, I think the challenge is on your side. We can still hear okay. and All right. Okay, no, that's fine. Continue then. All right, no problem. All right, thanks, Honorable Hadebe. All right, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members. Um, on the blue, what we're trying to highlight there is, and, and dealing with a topic that says preventative controls, is for the institution now to also focus on implementing effectively these preventative controls, especially now that we are dealing with the COVID-19 response. A lot of money is now being spent, so therefore it would require sound financial management disciplines um, to ensure proper recording and accounting of these transactions. So we've given that message to the accounting officer. We've already had a meeting with the accounting officer whereby we tried to understand some of the key initiatives they implemented to try and make sure that in the end we don't have a problem when we have to do the COVID-19 expenditure. We've also offered, um, in line with the AG's commitment to the president, um, our, our services to the institution whereby we are doing a proactive audit on these expenditures as and when they are happening so that we are able to advise them and give them the necessary input so that they can hopefully cause correct in the event that maybe we would have identified any shortcomings rather than come end of next year um, and then uh, 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 highlight or report certain shortcomings. So the accounting officer just needs to make sure that uh, the accounting officer has done a proper heightened improved risk assessment, um, identifying and, 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 and catering for the new and existing risks, and then make sure that the procurement is done in line with the, with the uh, legislation. Um, internal audit function has offered to do some work of assurance on these expenditures as and when they are happening. We are collaborating with the internal audit function. We are talking to them. And then also um, they must make sure that they capacitate the finance and the, intern, uh, the supply chain management unit so that they can respond to this increased level of activities because now they must deal with COVID-19 and all the other normal responsibilities as well. So it was just a synopsis to say uh, two parts. We are still a bit concerned. Um, we've communicated to these respective institutions However, on the left-hand side, there's also this COVID thing that we must respond to. We've had engagements with them to say, please proactively manage this by implementing the proper preventative controls. And then, Chair, the two last slides, the one is we've given recommendations to the department and the entities. So uh, we've spoken about the effective implementation of audit action plans, uh, focusing on the implementation of preventative controls. Prevention is better than cure. Uh, focus on, uh, on filling the key vacancies We've noted the vacancies, DDG, CEO, CFO, DG level, um, enforcing consequence management and not just, um, if I can call it, um, at the risk of, 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 of using an inappropriate phase, a phrase, um, doing lip service. It must be a, a, a real consequence management. The DG has done certain presentations. We will then follow up on those representations and those follow-up actions. Um, then also make sure that they um, improve the controls around the quality of the financial statement preparation and, its, and the ability to comply with legislation. Then, Che, I'm going to go to the last slide. Um, without sounding prescriptive or, or, or sounding like we are giving you work, um, we will also just appreciate the committee's um, commitment to uh, follow up with these particular institutions that when they come and engage with the portfolio committees, uh, SCOPA, oversight structures, ask them to give you explicit feedback on how they've implemented their action plans, their turnaround plans. Ask them, how have you filled your appointments? What's your plan? What are you, how are you dealing with the fruitless and wasteful expenditure, the irregular expenditure? Um, to that extent, Chair, at least if, if it's on record, that quarterly they come and they respond to these questions. When things go wrong, you can then say, but really, what is the real root cause of the problem here? Because you gave us a surgeon and you gave us a presentation that you had implemented all these plans. So where did we go wrong? It then becomes easier to um, look for the real root cause of the problem rather than be talking about audit action plans and, 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 and high-level um, discussions. Honorable Chair, honorable members, um, thank you for your patience and your, your um, attention. We've come to the end of the presentation. We shall now take questions or comments or inputs. Thank you, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members. Honorable Chair, Person. Thank you very much. Please do indicate if you want to 
I've seen uh, Honorable Dirks in the group who will be first off the bat um, and then we will, um, so colleagues will indicate if you, as usual, right? Honorable Dirks, Honorable Mente. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, I trust that you can hear me. Uh, Chairperson, uh, firstly, let me thank the, um, the AG for this detailed report. I think it goes a long, the report goes a long way in assisting us in when the departments the department comes and appear before the committee. Uh, I think that at our, at our last meeting with the department, we actually took a decision that we want the water boards come and appear before the committee because uh, we found that at the water board level, that's where the problems were. The unauthorized expenditure, the um, corruption was actually there at the, the level of the water boards. Now, we requested that those water boards uh, must come to appear before us. Uh, I don't know in the beginning that I hear you correct that you say that the audits on the water boards are not completed yet, because uh, I think we need more detail on those water boards before they come and appear before the, the portfolio uh, committee. But I want to thank the, the department, the AG for the report because it, 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 was, it was indeed very detailed. However, my, there's a concern that I have. You see, we can deal with the entities in the country and with the departments in our country. My concern is with uh, uh, the LHDA, which falls outside our financial um, uh, scrutiny. Uh, to some extent, it falls not not to some extent. It actually falls completely outside our financial scrutiny. It's, uh, they are not subjected. They are not subjected to the same kind of financial oversight as entities in the country. So I have a concern with the, the LHDA, and I want to find out from the AG: Is there no way that we can actually bring that thing under our financial scrutiny? Uh, because although the AG say there's some progress that has been made, they, they've made some progress, but they've met with the, with the auditors of the, of the, L, uh, LA, with the LHDA, they met with their auditors, they say there's some progress, they've met with those auditors. Uh, that is not good, good, good enough. Because if you start scratching there, you'll see the kind of irregularities that has happened over the last uh, few decades. Uh, because we know that thing was started under the apartheid government, uh, the Highlands Water Project was started under them, and there was simply no uh, control measures put in place. So here we are giving money, millions of millions of rents over to the to uh, to that agency, and that agency is not really accountable to, to us. So we need to try and find a way of bringing that thing uh, uh, to account to, to us. Then lastly, uh, uh, just a comment. You see, I've noticed, and AG has also noted the high turnover, the high turnover of DGs in that department. But that's a serious problem. Once you have such a high turnover of, of DGs in the in, in, in the department, definitely you have you'll have instability, you'll have financial instability, and officials will then just do as they please, and you'll find all these irregular expenditure because of the problem, the problem with management at management level. So we need to, the department must seriously address the issue about this high turnover of DGs. Because you cannot have so many DGs in such a short space of time. DG serves for a few months, new DG, acting G, DG. You can't have the kind of situation. You will not be able to address the issue of expenditure in the department if you have no stability at the leadership level. That's just my final comment. But anyway, thank you very much, uh, AG, for the uh, the report, and we take note also of that you love actually Kirk Franklin. Uh, we will not be able to celebrate and play it just yet because uh, things are too not right in this country. Thank you very much. All right, Honorable Mente. Uh, Andres and your team just note the questions. Yes, thank you, Chair. All right, thank you, Chair, and thank you to AG for your presentation. Can you hear me, Chair? Yes, I can. Okay. Thank you, AG, for your presentation, and good day to colleagues and everyone.
My concern, I have two areas of concern in terms of this report. Uh, on page, from page 19, 30, 35, and then 37, there is um, a clear indication of interventions that are required within the department. And in, uh, on page 37, you have summarized it much more better, where you are showing us that there's no financial health, um, oversight and monitoring, uh, financial management is not there, performance management, procurement and contract management, which is at most important, and the compliance management. So in terms of areas of focus and areas of activity where financials are concerned and the expenditure thereof in the department are in the extreme red. I would put it that way. How would, you, how would you advise us to deal with this area of concern where there is high need of intervention? Because the financial health of uh, the department before it was merged to human settlement, we all know that it was in, uh, on the minors. And if it's on the minus, then it, it requires the interventions. But how, how can we come into this in terms of the financials? But also, most importantly, how did you help them, the department, and what were their response on the interventions that you have uh, sponsored from your side as AG? Then, uh, secondly, I see you, you gave us... Um, I can't remember which page now, but the, on the programs, you gave us all the programs and the sampling you have undertaken in terms of auditing uh, the department. But there's this one program where you say you did not audit, I think it's on purple, it was an, having an indication on the purple, purple area, and that program had a budget of 100% spent. However, the progress of the actual project was just at 38%. Could you help us with uh, more details of that, of such a program? Because if even if you did not work on its audit, I think it's quite imperative for the committee to deal with it because where 100% of budget is already spent and there's only 38% of progress, that's an indication of a huge financial crisis where money is spent and there is no value for it. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll stop there for now. Thank you. All right. Can and I'm some uh, researcher she just wants to uh, raise an issue, so go, go. Oh, Chair, I just had uh, one concern from Program 1 that on in the Department of Water and Sanitation, the War on Leaks program, the, the, the bulk of the budget for that program came from program one, which is under administration. Hello? Yes, we could proceed. Okay. Now, for the concern for me, Chairperson, is if the AG does not audit program one, then is it not possible that there are issues which could be not detected because that program is not being audited?
Is everyone frozen? Chair, are you there? No, it, I think it's the chair who's frozen, Ben. Yeah. Yes, Ben. Yes, are you yes, done? Ben. I'm... All right. Um, no, all right. Let's get. Uh... We can hear you, Honorable Mente. Chair. All right. Um, okay, AG. Andres? Yes, Chair. All right. I think you can respond uh, to, to the questions. And I think um, the ones that have been fielded, because this was a, a, a briefing and preparation for the hearing and the other Che, che, che we, lost you. we lost you when you said in preparation for Che. Solid basis. Um, I'm saying that um, we this 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 was a briefing ordinarily for the preparation of the hearing, um, and so our you know worst held fears about the state of health in the department, and we've got yes, a solid basis now to move ahead. Um, can I get uh, Honourable Soto? I see his hand is and. Uh, hearing my network is doing what it does most during this time. Thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. With, with your with your with your intervention, uh, I think with the last slide provided by the AG team uh, for our indulgence when we meet uh, various departments for accountability. Uh, I think for now, one is covered. So the, main, the main one uh, here is, is for the fact that on what they have audited, um, uh, they could, they could uh, justify uh, that the budget uh, has been spent at, at above 98 percent, but when you look into the actual deliverables, they are just above 50 percent, which tells you uh, the story uh, of a financial standing uh, of the department, the big problem uh, in as far as financial uh, accountability, which really needs the department to account for such a kind of a standing, which is the same uh, view which has been expressed by uh, Honorable uh, Amante when she looked into uh, the, I think someone looked on the war uh, Nix, uh, a project, uh, which was never uh, part of the budget uh, of the department. So all those kinds of things uh, with somewhat uh, 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 account for the fact that there is an urgent need for the department to be brought forward uh, for such a report to be uh, somewhat uh, finalized with them. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Semakai and Yazu Vaswagar. No, I think you are still you are audible. Okay, no, Kevil. Kevil Chairman. Kabila Chairman. Of course. Thank you very much. All right.
Doctor, can you hear anything from our side? can I come in, Chair? Constitutional are you there? Yes, I'm here. Mm. No, no right, uh, you I got the floor. Yes, thanks so much, Chairperson. Uh, mine is just two questions. I'm, is, uh, I'm going to direct them to the Auditor General. My question is, uh, I just want to check if the Auditor General have um, the in which extent do which their institutions engages with the SIU in respect of providing information. And the other thing is, in 2006, the Auditor General undertook a study on expenditure spent on bulk infrastructure projects. There were some hard-hitting findings. From 2006 to date, has the department made progress in addressing the findings? Or has the department regressed over the years with expenditure spent on bulk infrastructure? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, uh, um, my my well, network. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, all right. Andre? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, Chair. Okay, so um, in the in the absence of, of, of any other further guidance from the Chair, I'm going to proceed, Honorable Members, until such a time that the Chair can hear us. I, I assume that I'm empowered right, then to continue. You can, you can respond, Andre. I just think the final... Thank you. So, we didn't get the last comment. Koba, Andres, Koba. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, Honorable Sonia. Okay, proceed. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, um, let's start with Honorable Dirks. I think Honorable Dirks um, mentioned a, a number of comments um, from our side. They seem to be directed to these institutions that must come in account. Um, Honorable Dirks, what we mentioned in the beginning of the of the presentation is that um, the financial outcomes that we are presenting here today are for the financial year of June 2019, so the financial year that ended then. So there's been a number of developments that has happened, obviously, in this waterboard space, but we did not have that information because we haven't engaged in the audits for 1920. So uh, ordinarily, like I mentioned, we would have briefed uh, oversight structures such as, such as yourself, um, in October, November, um, had the audits been finalized on time, but because the audits were running late and were only finalized in March, uh, with the department presenting its annual report in, in, in March or tabling its annual report in March. That's why we're only having these engagements now. Um, but in, insofar as this information is concerned, um, yeah, uh, let's wait and see for the, for the, for the next financial year what uh, the audit, those audits will reveal. And as soon as those are finalized again, we will come and engage the, the oversight structures. Um, then, Honorable Dirts mentioned a comment with regard to the LHDA um, and the fact that location-wise, they have their locality outside of our borders. Um, Honorable Dirks, it's appreciated. However, we were always moving from the point of view that in terms of the Constitution, Section 217, when we pay funds and any money is over, we have to have some form of mechanism as an institution to make sure that we comply with section 217 of our constitution. And um, to that effect, we were also quite accepting of the, the, the scenario and the circumstances were quite appreciative. And that's why we also turned our attention to the Lesotho Highlands Water Commission to say this commission was set up exactly 
with that in mind to say, you've got an entity that's in a different country and another entity that's doing the implementation sitting in a different sovereign uh, uh, location. So this commission was exactly set up to try and make sure that it deals with those matters of governance. Our particular gripe just deals with the fact that we feel that the institution, our institution TCTA, did not always fully utilize the mechanisms available to it to ensure some form of compliance with Section 217. So there is merit in, in, in the challenges, but there's also some of the other institutional arrangements which were already there that were not always enforced uh, entirely. And that detail, Honorable Dirks, is the one that we spoke about when we were dealing with the detail on slide number 11, where you'll see those ones, if you recall during the presentation, we highlighted them, they were in red. And then, um, Honorable Mente, um, thank you for the question, Honorable Mente. Honorable Mente mentioned a couple of our key slides. Um, in terms of our advice to oversight, Honorable Mente, is exactly what we are doing here today, is to give you these outcomes, to give you these root causes so that you are empowered to engage with these institutions with uh, full uh, purview of, of, the, of the circumstances and the information at your disposal. Um, for, from an oversight point of view, if you look at the very last slides we've included, here are the recommendations that we normally give to our institutions based on the root causes we would have identified. And it's for them to take those recommendations to heart and go and implement them in their respective institutions. So what we also do, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, you would recall audit is a very retrospective process. So the auditors come in in the end, and they tell you what has gone wrong, but for that, the financial years already ended, the time has gone. So from an AG point of view, we've implemented a number of initiatives. One of them is what we call the status of records review, which is now linked to uh, also Honorable Mente's um, uh, comment around the, the, the red honeycomb. That initiative, Honorable Mente and Honorable Chair, or three Honorable Chair, is exactly intended to give management feedback before the end of the financial year. So we did that review now for the third quarter ending um, 31 December, and on some institutions we did it for the quarter ending March. So we said to management, you still have some time, two months, three months, four months before you need to give us financial statements. Here are the issues that you need to focus on the red areas. Please go and pay the necessary attention to them so that hopefully then you are able to improve your circumstances for financial statement submission. So. In conclusion, the committee should just focus on the recommendations we've made, hopefully, and with a big uh, uh, pleading from our side, and then also uh, the, the information that we've given you, uh, please utilize it uh, effectively in, in, in empowering and capacitating yourself on the issues to deal with them. Um, yes, Chen? Can I proceed, members, honorable members? Okay, so then Honorable Mente asked also a very specific question in terms of the financials and the financial statements being in red. So Honorable Chair, Honorable Mente, Honorable Members, you would recall when we touched on slide number 19, and I will also deal with it in, in line with the question that, um, that um, Honorable Somio um, uh, noted in terms of the money that's spent in the programs, that, that, that the actual achievement that is not correlating or reflecting the expenditure patterns. So, um, honorable members, the institution came to parliament. They asked for certain funds. They had a plan. They had projects which they said they are going to achieve in, in that plan. And then what ended up happening in prior years, they then started engaging in projects that were not budgeted for, with the consequence then that they took the money that were earmarked and uh, projected to be spent on certain projects, they spent them and redirected them to those uh, not approved or not budgeted for uh, projects. And then obviously they somehow also continued uh, with the engaging the service providers on the projects which were already on the plane. So what that then resulted in is a situation where now you owe people a lot of money. So next year when you come and you ask money from parliament to go and implement your plan and your budget, you actually then dip into that budget to pay expenses from the previous year. And that's why the liability amounts were so high, the accruals in the liability amounts. So every year for the past two or three years, the department has been playing catch up 
to pay some of those expenses that they were incurring in the previous financial years, uh, and also as a result of all these unbudgeted projects that they had uh, commenced. And that's why you'll see for the current year, expenditure looks to be 100% or close to 100% spend, but the actual performance is not reflecting that. And because we ordered the 18, 19 financial year, we look at those items in your plan, which you said you are going to achieve with the money you had come to ask and was allocated to you for the 18, 19 financial year. And then we find that the money spent on previous year's projects or trying to catch up as well. Similarly, um, honorable chair, um, the, the question that was asked on, on the war on leaks. So a number of, 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 of these um, assessments that we do are risk driven. So we have to identify where as the office of the AG, we feel the risk lies based on the information and our risk assessment processes. So if you look at the pro programs that we've included in page uh, 17 of, this, of the presentation, um, the, the, the programs that we selected for testing are the ones where normally your service delivery would be happening. War on leaks in its history was never included in the department's APP, although they were spending money on it. So eventually when they brought it over to the department's plan, they had no space to really park it in, if I can call it like that, and it was put under prog program one. Program one would normally be your administration uh, uh, budget, where you deal with your own internal administration affairs. So now you have this project here, which seems to be talking to aspects of service delivery, but it's parked in program one. However, if you look at the analysis of the of the department's plan, the bulk of the money is still going to the infrastructure. And hence, we selected those for testing. But we are comfortable from a risk point of view, because if you look at slide number 19, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, um, this war on leaks project was already uh, uh, covered and audited as part of our previous year's audit as well. And so this year we did do some follow up on that project. And that's why you see we are able to report on it on page uh, 19. So it's not that it was entirely missed because we skipped that program. So we still selected the project from a follow up point of view based on work we had done in the previous financial year. And those findings were then given um, accordingly to management. Then, um, Honorable Chair, um, honorable members, honorable Somio, I think I've addressed that comment in terms of the, the, the budget and the spend and the del deliveries. Uh, like I mentioned, it is part of the initial projects where um, we in incurred expenditure on projects that were not budgeted for, resulting in overspendings in those particular years, and, and now we're playing catch up. Then, honorable Motrala asked uh, two questions um, regarding our engagements with these investigative bodies. Honorable Chair, honorable members, we do have. Uh, institutional arrangements between the two offices or um, our office and these other uh, bodies with uh, investigative uh, capabilities or skills. Um, just to give you an example, um, Honorable Mutlala through you, Chair, um, on the Guiani project, we did work first, we identified certain concerns, and when we started reporting, by the time the case was handed over to the SIU, the SIU actually engaged uh, extensively with us, whereby we gave them certain information uh, for them to then conduct their uh, uh, responsibilities in line with their mandate. So it depends on the nature of the request, but certainly they do request information from us from time to time, and we do interact um, uh, based on the need uh, in the particular engagement or situation should they be busy conducting an investigation and they require um, our, our assistance. We do this through the office, our uh, our, our um, specialized audit services unit in our organization, where those uh, colleagues then engage directly with the SIU. Then, Honorable Chair, um, this is probably the one of the more tougher questions that we've had so far. It's the one on the bulk infrastructure findings. I'm not sure if Honorable Mutlala is referring to a 2006 report or a 2016 report. What I do know is that in our portfolio, we did do a, a, a bulk infrastructure, a water bulk infrastructure performance audit in 2016. A performance audit, honorable chair, honorable members, is now different to the regulatory or the statutory audit. This is now an audit where the office of the AG will get specialized skills and they look at those projects, not just from a compliance point of view, from an accounting point of view, they look at the effectiveness and the efficiency of the delivery. That's more almost uh, focusing on your service delivery aspect. That report did highlight certain findings in terms of the bulk infrastructure. They noted significant backlogs 
that uh, the department still had in terms of the bulk infrastructure and a project that we're running behind. Um, we can report that there was some effort in, in trying to deal with the backlog and trying to deal with those findings. But obviously, in uh, since 2015, 16 year, there were also quite a bit of uh, uh, tense relationships between us and, and, and the department. So to that extent, um, with all these other projects that were now being incurred, that were not budgeted for, it still exacerbated the problem. So there was some interaction or intervention to try and deal with it. However, that's not been eradicated uh, entirely. And I think maybe um, the department would be best to come and report in terms of that, because we didn't specifically focus on that. Like I said, we conduct statutory audits. That was a clear, specific engagement in terms of being a performance audit. Uh, but we do know that they had started doing something. They can just come in and give more detail to the to the committee in terms of that. Then um, somebody also um, asked a question, which I sort of deduced that it was, uh, 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 yeah, it, it, I think it was Honorable uh, Mente or somebody that asked, what is, how is the department listening to us when we give them um, these findings? Are they implementing our, our findings? Honorable Chair, Honorable Mente, um, directly uh, responding to the two of you as members who were in the previous committee as well. You would recall that one incident where the previous minister came and disputed the AGC regular expenditure findings. I was unfortunately also part of that process where we had to respond and give our version of, of events. But the relationship has at least now improved to where we really see the current acting accounting officer along with uh, 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 his support trying to implement and enforce consequence management, trying to improve the situation. Uh, we can't attest to whether that's being successfully done. We will only be able to then uh, give you any feedback um, when we go back in and we conduct the audit for the 1920 financial year. And thank you, Honorable Chair. Thank you, Honorable Members. I hope I have addressed all the comments and the questions that were directed at us. Yeah, no, sorry, AG. I was referring to the 2016 report. You are correct. Thank you. Mm. Thank right. you. Thank um, you, Mutan. All right, uh, colleagues, I think uh, as, as indicated, this is part of our uh, preparatory work, the basis of our um, oversight and parliamentary responsibility as COPA um, is the work of the AG. And of course, there are serious issues which uh, are before us in so far as water and sanitation are concerned. It is for that reason why we will um, have to consider very seriously um, continuing with the inquiry into the Department of Water and Sanitation as per the Fifth Parliament Legacy Report. Uh, we will prepare the documentation and the report in that regard and so far as where that work ended off so that we can be in a position to take a decision. Uh, it's my considered view that um, there is merit uh, in us as parliament probing very seriously what happened in the department of water and sanitation uh, and also to deal with the issue of war and leaks which continues to be a perennial headache and of course one which has not actually yielded the you know intended uh, outlook which it was actually uh, put together for as we indicated when the minister and the acting DG were before us some two weeks ago, the war on leaks is one of the major areas where corruption has taken place. And that three billion rands spent on it, unless we make full use of the people trained, will become a wasteful ex ex expenditure. You will recall that the department is trying to now experiment with the the people trained on war on leaks to be actually be uh, to guard uh, water tanks that have been put up for uh, the COVID-19 relief programs. And the argument is that those people are not security guards. There is much needed work that they need to do uh, and their expertise need to be deployed correctly, particularly creating cooperation in municipalities. So the water and sanitation headache remains with us for the a foreseeable future and we're going to need to concretize on action steps um, but I do believe that uh, Parliament will be well served uh, to fully probe the ongoings at the Department of Water and Sanitation 
uh, particularly from um, 2014, uh, wherein the systemic collapse and corruption seemed to begin to entrench itself, uh, landing us with the crisis which um, have actually uh, are all are there for everyone to see. So, AG, we thank you for your work, and I believe that you have uh, cleared the way for us to understand uh, even better that there is work that needs to be done. And I think that uh, colleagues have raised substantial issues which uh, speak to the state of health or lack thereof of the Department of Water and Sanitation, and it will require our uh, urgent attention. So as indicated, the fifth parliament was supposed to uh, have an inquiry uh, that did not get off the ground in the manner in which uh, it was envisaged. And whilst the Fifth Parliament scope had dealt with it in one way or the other, it has not been brought to a logical conclusion, which uh, will, amongst other things, ensure consequence management. So I think uh, we must, as uh, our immediate priorities, when the lockdown is lifted and Parliament is fully in session, uh, actually uh, commence with that uh, particular work. But documentation and the reports will be prepared um, in that regard. Um, and then we'll take it from there. I hope colleagues have received the responses from the department following their appearance. Uh, colleagues, to please go through that as well um, so we can make um, informed decisions. So I think uh, we can thank the AG and uh, indicate to them we will be expecting to continue interacting with them uh, and we may request as parliament as but we must give a space and time to appropriations to deal with it uh, because it's something that they unveiled it will keep it on our radar because in any case as part of the reporting that escom has to do uh, it was about internal controls and we've also we are we, we they have submitted reports on consequence management and so on they are caught they are reports that were due to us on the 30th um of um, of 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 march so that being the case escom will appear be um, all those matters but what we must do is duplicate activity when they appear before us, they have to um, have clarified all those things to the ongoing oversight that we are doing uh, on just that we are on the same page and use their work as a basis uh, for, for moving forward. So we will continue to leave no stone to, us to ensure that uh, we, we, we are on our side to do things uh, correctly. So, so I think I would like to take meet next week. Having said that, in the absence of any other hand, going once, twice, thrice, right, the meeting stands adjourned. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Chair. We appreciate it. Thank you, Chair. Good weekend. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Shop shop. Oh, shop. Each other. Hey, give me a go lap.
is too harsh. Yeah. Okay. So okay. Um, if you could, if it's possible, just to change and then face uh, towards that light, so that it can shine a light uh, on you instead of uh, you are. Good afternoon. Hello, madam. Can you please uh, let uh, Ms. Muntu in, um, in in the meeting? She's waiting. Um, I haven't received any notifications. That is much. We want to Yes, I haven't received any notifications here that I must let somebody in. Is it? 